Hello, come on in. My name is Rick Booth. Welcome to wood carving. Today, I'm going to be carving something functional. And what I'm working on right now is this little sugar scoop. These are a lot of fun to do, and it doesn't take a lot of tools to do it either. This particular one, I've just drawn out the pattern and cut it out with a bandsaw. Then I set it in my bench hook here, and it gives me something to brace against. Then I'm just carving it right out. Now, when I'm carving this, I'm using a curved gouge today. You notice how it's got a curve that comes around here? And it's a number eight, which means it has a fairly wide sweep and takes out a pretty big chip. That curve helps because you can scoop down in the bottom and get this shape. If it was a straight gouge, you wouldn't be able to get that curve down the bottom. See how that tool just sort of naturally follows the curve of our scoop? These are a lot of fun to make, and it's the sort of thing that a woodcarver would have made back on a farm centuries ago. As a matter of fact, the first one I made was uh, watching my dad out by the barn, oh, many, many years ago. And it's fun, too, because it's a little bit different, and what I enjoy about it the most is I enjoy being able to carve things that you can use at home. It kind of gives an added dimension to what you're doing. I think that's about as far down as I want to go here. Now for doing the back, I'm going to use a flat chisel. This is a number two gouge, actually, and it's almost flat. And I'm going to use that to do the back. Now I'm saving the back for the last because that way when I'm carving out the hollow part, I have this flat surface I can work with. You notice that the tool kind of digs into this uh, bench hook back here, and that's why it's wood. It gives you a nice, safe stop for your tool. Let me check. Don't want to make that too thin. Looks about right. I'll turn it around, come around from the other side. These are things that are nice to have in the kitchen to use, or they also make nice gifts. So you don't find too many of the handmade ones anymore. Most of them, the past few decades, are done by machine. Now as I'm carving here, you notice how this is starting to splinter in here and starting to dig in? That means I'm going against the grain. And if I were to keep pushing there, I'd just rip that out. I'll be telling you about this grain quite a bit, because it's one of those things that's fairly important. But it's not too hard to learn. It just takes a little practice. You see, now when I come back the other way, I can just clean those right off. No splinters. There's something really fun about the feel, the warm feel of a scoop like this in your hand. They're much more comfortable than metal one or plastic. And they're also handy, too, if you have a lot of gunpowder you need to scoop up because the wood doesn't make sparks. And that's one of the things I used these for centuries ago. That's about as far as I can get with a gouge. I'll just trim the rest down with a knife. Find a nice little place to sit here. I'll just use the whittling stroke. I'm going to come along here and pare that down. These are great because you can just sort of take them out in the back porch. Or if it's a rainy day, you can sit by the fireplace in the evening and do them. And it's a nice shape to work with, too. The other thing that's fun about these scoops, and they, once you get started on them, they really will get into your system. You'll just have to keep making more and more and more of them. One of the things about them is you can vary the shape to anything you want. It can be a very personalized little piece of equipment. You can make them big. You can make them small. You can make the handle long. If you want to get real fancy, you can try carving what is the pinnacle of scoops and that is the Welsh love spoon, which basically is just a spoon or a scoop with a long handle. Some of these handles got to like two feet long, and they would carve intricate knotwork and borders and fancy little figures in them. As a matter of fact, it's the type of project that, well, they call them love spoons because 
It's a, some, something that the, uh, the boyfriend would make for his girl. And there used to be an old phrase for courting called spooning. And that's where it came from, from people sitting around making these spoons for their intended. Well, anyway, just keep working around here with that scoop and just keep coming around there until you get the shape just as you want it. And don't rush it. Use a little creativity and do something that's really unique to you. And then I suggest sanding them smooth when you're all done. And that'll give you a nice smooth finish. When you get done, you're going to have something that looks, well, it's going to look like this one. And this is sort of a shaker pattern. And this one here is a large one. It's basically the same shape. It's just made in different proportions. And then you have a small one here that I made for the sugar bowl. Now this one is much lighter in color because it's uh, a lot newer. These other two have been done a few years ago, and I rubbed a little vegetable, uh, vegetable oil in them to seal the wood. And that also darkens it over the years, too. These are great because you can use them for scooping flour and sugar. And we all know what you do with flour and sugar. We make cookies. And that's what I'd like to show you next. To make the old-fashioned cookies, you need an old-fashioned cookie mold. And that's what I have right here. This is a Springerly mold. And this particular type of mold was uh, one that was used for centuries and centuries in Germany and Northern Europe. They're not too hard to make either. You can make it with just a few simple tools. To start out, let me clear the decks here. To start out, you just need a piece of wood. I would suggest using a piece of wood like uh, poplar or basswood, something that's uh, a little harder than pine, a little tighter grain, because uh, the pine can, can split a little bit and it won't last quite as long. Now, this piece of wood is rough on back and I've drilled a hole in it. To get the center point for my hole, I've just drawn a couple lines where the diagonals intersect and then drilled a hole down there with a 3 8 inch drill bit. And that will fit our handle. Here we go. And the handle will fit in there. That will give us something to pick up our mold with. Now to smooth this wood off, don't use sandpaper. Use it plain. Because sandpaper, when you sand a piece of wood with it, it leaves little bits of grit inside there. And that can really dull down your carving tool. So sand it, or uh, so plane it instead. And that way I've planed off all my little pencil marks and the fuzzies left from the drill. And I've just sketched in a little design here, just a couple of lines to help me. And the center part will be for the flower. And then that line will show where the petals will be. They call these Springerly molds because from, it was derived from a word from an old German dialect. And the Springerly was a small jumping horse. And it seems that back in the pagan days, these people would celebrate the Yule feast or the winter solstice, which corresponds with our Christmas time. And back many years ago, they actually used to use uh, animal sacrifices for doing this, back in the pagan rites. And Springerly was a sacred animal to the king of all the Nordic gods, whose name was Wotan. In one year, I guess somebody decided, hey, instead of sacrificing animals this year, let's make cookies. And so that's what they did. And they got more and more creative. Instead of just being small horses, they started making different designs on them. And instead of just sacrificing the cookies, they ate them and they'd hang them on evergreen trees, which were the forerunners of our Christmas tree. Now you notice how simple it is to make this design in here. I'm using a number eight gouge that's seven millimeters wide. And I'm pressing down to make a stop cut. And then, I just take this and come back and make a little half moon chip. This is just like that one we were doing on our uh, relief carving cat the other day. Remember those little half moon chips? Now the trick in doing these is you have to think backwards. Okay, I'm making a depression here, but when I make the cookie, it's going to be a raised design. 
So whatever you do in there, you have to keep thinking backwards. And I think part of the magic of doing these is you never really know until you're all done just what your design is going to look like. There's a flower. Now I'll carve the petals. I'm just going to take and make a cut this way. You could also do this with a knife if you wanted, but as long as I've got my gouge handy, I'm going to use the gouge. I'll make another one this way. You see these cookie molds in all sorts of different shapes. You see them in the forms of animals, bunny rabbits and stags. You see a lot of flowers and <laughs> springtime symbols, too. I think around December 25th, they're really looking forward to spring up there. Now, to carve the veins of the leaf, I'm going to use my V-gouge. Now, this one I've got the handle wrapped with a little cord. This is how they do it in Switzerland, because you can get a better grip on your handle, and you can actually whittle with it like a knife. Notice how I have my thumb braced against that, and I just make my design right into there. Come around, and I'll make the veins for the leaf. And using the same technique, I can come and just make a line up there for the center part of the flower. Now, when you get done with this, you're going to have something that looks a little bit like this one over here. Let me just take a minute and move these down a bit. And then you have the handle fitted on there. This one, the people have gone a little bit farther. And this old German one, they've beveled the edges along back here and then notched the edges, which you just take a knife and just notch those in. No big problem. Nice way to decorate it. But if you want to make a lot of cookies, then you might try this design. And this is a rolling cookie mold. This is one I patterned after an old one that was found up in Wisconsin, done sometime in the early 1800s. And this one is made of several different pieces of wood. This is a piece of birch that I got just from a doll at the hardware store. And then you take this cross piece apart. You want them to fit snugly. And this piece is about uh, three and a half inches long, and that fits to the handle. Then we have the small pieces. And these are about two and a half inches. It, it's not all that critical. It's kind of up to you whatever you want to make. And then you take and put your design in the roller. And this will roll out three of them with one swipe, so you can make lots and lots of cookies. The only trick you're going to find to making this is making this round part. Now, I know what you're thinking. You're probably saying, oh, yeah, well, I know at the hardware store I can buy these two-inch round banister poles, and why can't you make it out of that? One of the reasons is a lot of those banister rails are made out of fir or spruce. They're very brittle, very tough, and hard to carve. So I'm going to use a piece of poplar here. And I'll put that in the vise. Now what I've done is I've taken a pencil and drawn a diagonal across here for each side. That gives me the center point of this piece of wood. And then I've taken a drawing compass and drawn a circle around that. I've done this on both sides. And that way, when I'm drilling my hole, I can drill it in both halves and have it meet in the middle and make sure that my hole is pretty well down the center. If it's off center, then when you're rolling your cookie mold, it's going to go ka-clunk, 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 and you're going to have lumpy cookies. And you don't want that. I'm going to use a 3 8 inch hole in this because I can get a 3 8 inch round dowel at the hardware store. and It'll be a good standard shape to work with. See what we got there. Almost. Well, you just keep doing that until you get the hole going through the middle. And then you want to make that round. I think the easiest way to do that is to use a couple of gouges. 
And I'm going to start out, well, let's see, I've got a number seven here. That just about matches the curve of that uh, circle. I'll just take and split off some pieces here. Now you don't want to try and take this all down at once because if your wood should split, that can run wild on you. Knock that corner off. Come over here and I'll knock this one off. See, now that started to turn down just a little bit. And then smooth it up, you can use a flatter gouge or even a knife and just whittle that around. Just pare it down a little. And that's really all there is to it. Just keep working around there and get a nice smooth little shape. Now for carving the design, it's exactly the same as with the other one. What you want to do is mark out your pattern first and this particular piece of wood is about two inches in diameter. So that works out to, let's see, about three times the diameter. So it's about a six inch circumference around here. So we can put three designs in that are about two inches wide. So I'll mark the two inches off there. I'm going to make this rough. Draw a line, and I'm going to make a border on this one too. I'll show you a little different technique for using the gouges. Just move my pencil in about a quarter of an inch and then scribe a line and come around from the other side and scribe another line. So I just use my finger as a guide there. Now, to make one of the kind of neat fancy borders here, take a V tool and make a cut around here. It's kind of interesting. I was asking somebody the other day about the history of the Springerly cookies, and they had a different story. They said that the Springerly cookies were actually invented in 1750 by a woodcarver, a Dutch woodcarver named John Springerly. I kind of like the other story better, though. And this is a border here. That little double line will show you where to cut the cookies when you get them laid out. Now to make this little border, just take the gouge and come down and make out a little shallow scoop. Now look at that, see? Now, I'll trim that up with a V-tool. This way, when you go rolling that out, it'll give you a nice little scalloped print on your cookies. Now another way we can make a flower here is take the gouge, make a vertical stop cut around. So I'm just going to walk that around the curve of the cutting edge. This is about a number eight. So it makes a very small circle. It's a seven, number, a seven millimeter number eight gouge. And then to make the petals, I'm just going to take and make another scoop, just like I did on the border, and scoop those down. This is such a fine-grained wood that splintering isn't a problem. See, there are so many different kinds of designs you can make in these. You can use your imagination and take a tool and just do dozens and dozens of different designs. I think that's what fascinates me about them, trying to imagine in your head what these designs are going to look like. And then I can just round down the flower here with a knife, and that'll give us a nice little center. Now you can do this exactly the same thing for making the leaves by making little imprints in it. And that's the kind of style that we used on this one over here to make this design. Uh, this is exactly the same technique that I was just doing there. And we have one that has three cookies rolled out on it. 
This is one of my favorites, the one with the evergreen tree. Now, all we have to do is put this together. That's one of the things that really fascinates me whenever I think about it. Even though I've been carving for so many years, when you make something like this, it's like being a kid again. And there's our cookie mold. You know, I just can't stand it wondering what that impression is going to look like in the cookies. Let's make some cookies. I happen to have a few odds and ends here. Hey, what's a cookie mold without cookies? My antique rolling pin. This particular dough is a traditional Springerly cookie dough. And it's made with uh, some very simple ingredients. Let me put some flour on there. You just take four eggs and beat them until they're light, then add two cups of sugar. And then you whip that or beat it for 15 minutes, and it'll give you a nice, fluffy, lemony colored batter. Then you take uh, four cups of flour and sift it with one teaspoon of baking soda. And then you blend that in with the eggs. Put some more. Hey, I love making messes. Then you let that whole mixture stand for 15 minutes, which is kind of where we are here. Then you're ready for the cookies. Just roll it out until it's about a quarter of an inch thick. And then when we get these cookies cut on here, you want to bake this at a 300 degree oven for about 15 minutes. Now, let's see how these go. I'll rub a little flour on that. Get this started here, and away we go. Oh, look at that. I love it. You can only guess what your pattern is going to look like before you start to lay it down. And it, it, it's so exciting to see these things coming out in the dough. It's like being a kid again. You know, it's, just, it's the kind of excitement you never get tired of. You think, oh, you've been carving all these years, and you, you do one, and you, you, you've seen them all. But that's not the way it is. It, it, it's fantastic. Just love it. Now to cut these free, I'll take my knife a little distortion there. I know your grandmother had a different way of doing it. Well, I, I wish she was here to uh, <laughs> show me her method. <laughs> I understand that these were traditionally a, a Christmas cookie. And what they would do is often they would bake these cookies up several weeks in advance. I was talking to a real sweet lady the other day who was telling me about some Hungarian neighbors of hers who would take and make up a whole barrel full of these cookies and then let the uh, neighborhood children come in and have them for a few weeks. And she said after a while, they started getting pretty hard. And they're real dunking cookies. They're the sort of things that you want to uh, be able to dunk a little. Although if you don't like your cookies real hard, you can take a piece of apple and put it in the cookie jar, and that'll help keep them soft. They have a very nice lemony flavor to them. Traditionally, they'd also sent uh, these with anise to give it a licorice flavor. Let's see, I can't fit too many in my pan here. There we go. Ah, here, put that guy in there. Hey, what's a holiday without cookies? Now, traditionally, you would let these sit overnight to let the imprint harden. And that way, when you baked them, it'd give you a little sharper image. But I can't wait. Let's cook some up right now. Come on in. Let's knock off early. Why don't you come with me and uh, meet me in my house? I thought as long as we had this nice bed of coals, we'd cook our old-fashioned cookies the old-fashioned way. First thing is to take and put three pebbles in the bottom of this Dutch oven. And this will give an airspace between the bottom of that pan and our cookie tin, keep them from getting too hot. 
we set those inside and put the cast iron lid on top. Now take and scoop out some coals, make a little pile there. Then we'll just set this whole contraption right on top of that. Take another scoop of coals and we'll put these on top. There. That'll give us a nice even heat. We'll let these bake for 15 minutes and then we'll come and see what we've got. Oh, those do smell good. Oh, I can't wait to see what we've got here. Let's take and knock the ashes off. And lift it off the coals. Ooh, those smell good. Here you go. Off the bed with you. Mmm. These are so good. I love it. Next week, we're going to be carving a figure very closely associated with fireplaces and chimneys. Bring your carving tools, and I'll be showing you how to make this 19th century German-style St. Nicholas. So until next time, this is Rick Boots wishing you happy carving. How to Carve Wood, a book of projects and techniques by Rick Boots, is available by calling 1-800-950-WMHT. With more than 200 pages and over 400 photographs and illustrations, including patterns for some of the projects in the series, this companion guide presents important woodworking techniques. For your copy, call 1-800-950-WMHT. The cost is $17.95 plus handling. Please have your credit card ready when you call.